you know, help them in this very time of uh, immigration, the waiting period and everything. So um, I'm recording the meeting, guys, okay? All right. And everybody in this forum is muted. So for you to be able to use the microphone, I have to give you the permission. Or you can go ahead and go to um, the comment section. If you have anything to say, use the comment section. It has always been, uh, you know, we are very good at that. You know, we've grown to understand that when we are in a very public meeting like this, we have to understand that other people are there. So if you want to talk, if you have to use the microphone, make sure that your environment, you don't have so much interference, so much noise and disturbances around you so that we can all hear you and so that the meeting can go on freely, okay? All right, so thank you so much for joining in everybody. So without wasting much of our time, today is not a day for me to so, say so much. Uh, today is a day for you to listen to our guest, okay? So our guest is here, he's um, ready to give us all the, um, all the knowledge that you, you need about this immigration process, the waiting period, visa bulletin, everything, all your questions that you have about this very period right now, you can bring them on. And I believe that, you know, he'll be able to help out. All right. So um, um, with the person we have with us is a very good friend. He has been a very good friend for a time now, for some time now. He is an immigration lawyer here in uh, the U.S. He's based in Arizona. His name is uh, Mr. Douglas, uh, Mr. Douglas Kofi. Mr. Douglas Kofi is from Ghana. He has been in the U.S. for some time now, and he has been helping a lot, a lot of people. When I say a lot, you know, he takes his time. So when, since I started, you know, uh, partnering with him, he has shown me um, a great deal of uh, what it takes to mentor somebody. He takes his time to explain things for you people. So when he starts going like layman term and, you know, going above and beyond, just know that he's, that's his personality, okay? So that's that's how he does. It takes his time to explain things. And I was like, no, I'm going to let him explain this in a very broad way so that everybody, everybody can benefit from this wealth of knowledge that he has. All right, so Mr. Doug, uh, Mr. Douglas, um, I'm going to give it over to you right now so that you can start. I'll be on the background and, you know, I'll keep on admitting people, but you're free to share your screen and slide if you have anything like that, okay? Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you very much, uh, Decency. Um, everybody, good morning uh, in, in Arizona. It's about 10.05 a.m. I know it's uh, evening uh, where most of you are. Uh, my name is Douglas Kofi, as Decency said. I am an immigration lawyer. I am uh, currently licensed in Idaho, but also licensed to practice immigration law nationwide uh, in all 50 states in the US and, and, and the territories. The uh, uh, Today's topic obviously is, is on visa retrogression. I think that is the uh, the burning question on everybody's mind as to what it is, uh, how it's going to affect your immigration process in terms of coming over to the US, or if you're already in the US, how it's going to affect uh, uh, you getting a green card. So retrogression is, is basically a fancy word. Uh, all it means is backlog. That's that's all it means, backlog. Now, every year, uh, Congress designates uh, how many uh, employment-based visas USCIS can, can give out. And that number is 140,000. So the fiscal year starts uh, in October and ends in September. So between October to September, uh, USCIS can only issue 140,000 employment-based petitions. Now, you have to keep in mind that there's five different categories of the employment-based petitions, and the visa that most nurses are applying for is an EB-3 visa. Now, the EB-3 visa allocation is 28.6% uh, of that 140,000, and so that comes to about 56,000 visas that are available annually. So USCIS can only issue uh, 56,000 EB-3 visas, which is most of uh, the visas that nurses apply for on an annual basis. And so what USCIS does is that on a monthly basis, they take a look at the number of visas that have been applied for, the number of visas that they expect people to apply for, and then they make uh, the visa bulletin based on that. So if you look at the visa bulletin, uh, there's two different dates. And, and I think that's where most of the, uh, the confusion uh, comes from. So the visa bulletin, the dates are divided into two. One of them is the dates at which you're eligible to apply 
for a green card. The other one is the dates at which you are eligible for your green card to be approved. So there's there's two different dates. Now on the on the EB3 side as a whole for nurses, uh, that there's basically two steps involved in the process. The first step is the application of the I140. The, the I-140 is just basically uh, uh, the name of the form as an employment for an alien worker, uh, employment petition for an alien worker. And so that petition itself is the one that the employer uh, applies for on the U.S. side to the government. Now, when we submit that application, typically it takes between six to eight months. Now, the, the employer can choose to pay for premium processing for that specific portion of it. And if they pay for premium processing, Typically, you get a decision within you know, three to four weeks of receiving your receipt notice. And so it cuts down the, the timeline significantly. And so we get this question a lot, which is, uh, are employers still paying for premium processing during retrogression? And the answer is it doesn't make sense for employers to pay for premium processing during retrogression. And here's why. The, with visa, the visa is currently being retrogressed. You know, there's a, Right now, the visa uh, bulletin shows that the visa is retrogressed for about a year. And so if the employer pays for premium processing, you know, it's $2,500. The employer pays for that. Um, and you get your I-140 approved in, in three to four weeks. You still cannot do anything until your priority date becomes current. And so it doesn't give you any benefit for the employer to pay for premium processing at this point. And so that's why a lot of employers are not choosing to pay for premium processing at this point. Uh, it doesn't mean that the employer doesn't want you to get here earlier. It just means that there's no real benefit to paying for it because either way, you'd have to wait until your priority date becomes current uh, for you to be able to apply for a green card. And so if you look at the visa bulletin, uh, the first part is the final action dates, which basically means that that is the date, you know, at which USCIS, you'd be eligible to receive an immigration benefit, basically your green card. The second one is the, uh, the eligibility or the, the data which you can apply, you know. And so if you look at the bottom of, of the visa bullets in the second table, uh, the date on there, I think, uh, as of now, it's retrogressed about February, which basically means that if you have a priority date on or earlier than that date, then you're eligible to apply for, for a green card. For people that are outside of the U.S., um, it just means that you have a longer waiting period. And so the consequence of it is not really that dire, except that you have to wait a little bit longer. For people that are already in the U.S. on, a, on an F1 visa or a B1, B2 visa or any kind of temporary visa, the consequences are a little dire uh, because typically if you apply for your green card, you're eligible to remain in the U.S. until a decision is made on your application, which basically means that you have a DS status, which means that you cannot accrue unlawful presence. Basically, you cannot overstay your visa. So the moment you submit your application, and you get a receipt, you're temporarily allowed to remain in the U.S. until the government makes a decision on your application. Now, with the retrogression, you're not eligible to apply for that green card. And so when the employer applies for your I-140, you don't get that DS status. And so when your B-1, B-2 aspires, you run the risk of remaining in the country unlawfully. And so if you're in the U.S. and you have a B-1, B-2 visa or uh, an F-1 visa or any other visa that is about to aspire and an employer has applied for an I-140 for you, my suggestion would be you either find a different visa to adjust to. You can do a, a change of status from one visa to the other one, or you leave the country. Because if you remain in the country uh, past the expiration of your visa date, uh, you would have accrued unlawful presence if you remain for over 180 days, which is six months, six months past your expiration period. There's a six month grace period before you start uh, accruing unlawful presence. So if you stay beyond six months after the expiration of your status, what would happen is that when the employer petitions for you, you will not be eligible to adjust status unless the employer receives a waiver on your behalf. And those waivers are not easy to get, you know, they're difficult to get. And so the smart thing for you to do if you're already in the US on a visa would be to find some other status. I mean, you can apply for an extension of your B1, B2. Uh, you can go to school. Uh, there's other things that you can do in the meantime or, you know, find an immigration attorney to talk to to, to make you, you know, uh, not overstay your visa because you're going to have consequences down the road if you overstay your visa. Uh, the other thing is for people who are here on a J-1 visa. Uh, the J-1 visa is an exchange visitor's visa. 
uh, that typically has a two-year residency requirement. What that means is that if you arrive in the US on a J-1 visa, at the conclusion of your program, you are agreeing to go back to your home country for a minimum of two years before you can come back to the US for any kind of immigration benefit. Uh, now, there's a waiver for that J-1 visa, and there's very, very strict and specific uh, guidelines that you have to follow to get one of those waivers. Now, some of those reasons why you can get a waiver for a J-1 visa is if you have an asylum claim, if you have a legitimate fee of returning back to your home country is one of them. Uh, the second one is if you get a letter of no objection from the home government uh, saying that they don't object to you returning or you remaining in the U.S. and not returning home. And the third option is if you uh, if you get, you know, uh, employment with the government agency who can petition for you. I mean, those are some of the ways, uh, not exclusive, but those are some of the ways that you can get those waivers. And as you can imagine, uh, those are very difficult to get. Um, the other visas that nurses uh, are typically eligible for is an H-1B visa. Now, uh, the H-1B is typically reserved for people with advanced degrees. Now, some companies and some uh, staffing agencies and hospitals have been applying for H-1B visas for their nurses. The key criteria for an H-1B visa, no cap. So let, let me back up. The H-1B visa is, is, is typically in a lottery system, which means that there's X amount of visa numbers on an annual basis for an H-1B. And for you to apply for the visa, you have to basically play the lottery. You know, you put in your submission and if your application gets selected, then you're, you're eligible to apply for the visa. Um, for nurses, you know, there's there's a, 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 an arrangement where there's a no cap, which basically means that you can apply for the H-1B without going through the lottery process if you meet certain specific requirements. Now, some of those requirements is that you must have, you know, uh, an advanced degree. Now, we all know that as nurses, uh, you, you know, you don't need an advanced degree to, to become a nurse in the U.S. You can become a nurse in the U.S., with a diploma and associate's degree or bachelor's degree. Now, with this specialty occupation in nursing, uh, what you need to do is to have a specialty uh, occupation. And some of those specialty occupations that if you're uh, in anesthesia, uh, if you're like, uh, if you have a certification for uh, uh, a surgical nurse, you know, some sort of a advanced degrees, which typically requires a minimum of a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. Now, this retrogression is not, you know, we're hoping it goes away in the fall because that's where the beginning of the fiscal year happens. But there's no guarantee that it's going to go away in the fall because the way the retrogression comes about is an estimation of USCIS's visa numbers. Now, you have to remember that even though we have retrogression, people are still applying for I-140s. We applied. I mean, there's people on this call right now who who recently had their their. Uh, um, uh, their I-140 filing receipt notices. So we applied for a bunch of I-140s last month. And when the fiscal year opens, USCIS is going to look at the number of visas that we have or the number of applications that they have and make a decision and see whether or not the applications are going to exceed the maximum amount of visas they're, they're allowed to give out. And so if that number, if the applications, if, if the demand exceeds the supply or the, the available visa numbers, the retrogression is not going to go away. It's, you know, the, the visa is still going to be retrogressed because we have more applications that we do visas. And so I know that there's a lot of people who are hoping that it goes away in the fall, uh, in October. We all hope that, but there's no guarantee that it's going to, it's going to go away. And so if you're somebody who, um, uh, who has you know, goals of getting an advanced degree or you uh, 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 want to become something more than just a registered nurse, while you're waiting, it might not be harmful to you to seek some sort of an advanced degree to have the H-1B cap exempt uh, as, a, as a backup. Uh, so hold on one second. Decency, I think there's some people saying they can't hear what I'm saying. I don't know if there's... Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, 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 let's do a mic check for everyone. I forgot to do that. Um, all right, so um, if you're in this forum and you can hear, just go to the comment section and let us know. Before you do that, make sure that your volume is turned up all the way. If you're using a phone, try to turn up your volume um, of your phone so you can hear. And if you can actually hear, just let us know so we know where the problem is coming from, okay? All right, and we have 
and I forgot, uh, we have reached the max of this meeting, like 100 participants um, for now. So if your friends are out there waiting, I'll, I'll add them when someone um, gets um, dropped or something like that, I'll add them in. All right, so um, from the comment section, it looks like this might be an individual problem. So advice, if you're not hearing us very well, please, please, please kindly look at your device. You can try logging out and logging in again. Uh, look at your device, see if the volume is turned up all the way, and then we can go from there, all right? Okay, so I think it's just an individual problem. A lot of people can hear you loud and clear, all right? Okay. So um, where, where I left off was if, if you have goals and aspirations for uh, becoming an advanced degree nurse, my suggestion to you would be that while you're waiting for your visa, uh, your priority date to become current, it might not be a bad idea for you uh, to get some sort of an advanced degree in nursing. It can be um, uh, anesthesia, it could be uh, 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 med sir, I mean, some sort of specific, specific or specialty uh, nursing degree or a master's or something to that effect. That would make you eligible uh, for um, uh, for the H-1B no cap. The H-1B is, uh, is a very, very fast process. I mean, if uh, if you go the H-1B process, you can come to the U.S. within about six months or, or less. And it's a very, very quick process. And there's also uh, ways that the employer can, can get you a job, you know, do, in that specialty. And so most nurses, as, as you know, uh, you know, don't, don't have that advanced degree because it's not required. And so most people don't typically qualify for it. But if you if if you if you qualify for it, my suggestion would be uh, to to tell whichever staffing agency that you're working with to explore that option for you, as it can get you here a lot quicker than the EB three visa can. Um, so I've I know I've I've, I've talked a lot uh, for the last twenty minutes. I can we can pause and take some questions before we we go on further uh, decency if you if you like. Yeah. All right, so this is how we're going to do it. So if you have any question, um, please just go to the comment section and drop your question there. I will read out your question. And then because this is typically is not like we're giving a full blown lecture. So it's typically question and answer section. So because a lot of people have reached out to me, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that. So I said, let's bring the solution to you. And, uh, you know, let's bring a very um, renowned expert to you guys so you can hear from him and uh, maybe make an informed decision. So um, if you have any question to the comment section, um, uh, type your question in there and I'll read them out, okay? All right, so let's see if we have anyone. I have HND in pediatrics, how about that? Sir? So talking about, you know, getting an advanced degree, somebody is asking that she, he, I don't know if, she, okay, she, she has a HND that's higher national diploma in pediatrics. Does that count as um, you know a higher degree or di diploma? No. So an HND, uh, I know some West African countries, uh, Cameroon specifically, uh, has has an HND. Uh, they have an HND and a BSN. So an HND is is a nursing degree that that takes you three years to get. You know, so it's even shorter than a bachelor's degree. And so as far as U.S. purposes are concerned. They view when you go through the credential evaluation, the HND is akin or similar to uh, your associate's degree or diploma in nursing, and so it's even less. It's lesser than uh, than a bachelor's degree, and so certainly it's not it's not eligible. You have to have a bachelor's degree or higher uh, to be eligible for the H one B. All right, uh, thank you so much. The next question is asking: Are Nigerians still eligible for U.S. lottery um, options? I think that person is asking about the DV, uh, the, the yeah, diversity, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Mm -hmm. right. which is, you know, a different, a different issue. We can, we can discuss at a later time, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's outside of the realm of what we're talking about. And if that person wants to get a hold of me later. We can have that, that discussion. Right. So if you ever want to reach the, um, Mr. Douglas, uh, maybe to, di to discuss your options, please do let me know. Um, you can find me in all platforms of DNA. Just let me know and I'll find a way to arrange an appointment. He's a very, very busy person. So we can arrange an appointment for you to speak with him. All right. And um, 
you know, another person is asking, I have a bachelor's degree in nursing and post basic perioperative nursing diploma. Uh, would that count? So, um, you know, what we are saying, or well, let me just put this question in another in another way. Let me rephrase it. So if um, a, a particular person is um, a be the, the higher degree holder or a degree holder, can the person um, currently during this retrogression gain from the H uh, the HB1 uh, visa options. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the retrogression doesn't really affect. I mean, it's it's a, sort of a way around the 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 the, the, the visa. You know, now uh, the retrogression is it's only affecting the green card application process. So as as I mentioned, you know, there's two 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 ways or two. Uh, um, yeah, there, there's two steps involved in the process. The first step is the I-140 and then the, the EB-3 or the, the, the green card application process, consular process and down the road. For the H-1B, what it does is that it allows you to come to the U.S. earlier to start working. So, you know, a good example of the people who typically use the H-1Bs are all these tech people from India. You know, you see a lot of the tech tech people in IT. They don't have green cards, but they, they they're allowed into the U.S. to work and they have an H-1B visa, and they're working while they're waiting for their priority date to become current so they can be, apply for their green card. And so that's what that's the benefit of the H-1B is that it allows you into the U.S. earlier uh, than, than an EB-3 would. You know, you're basically coming to begin working while, you're, while your priority date becomes current. So is this uh, something that, you know, you are able to do, you know, like to file for people through the route of H-1B visas? Well, I mean, our office obviously does H-1B, uh, H-1B visas. The difficult part about the H-1B visa is that you have to have a specialty occupation. Right. So the job offer that you're going to receive cannot, you know, like uh, the, the standard offer you receive in your contract as nurses, just as a registered nurse, there's no specialty. Mm -hmm. uh, for an H-1B visa with, with no cap, uh, you have to have a specialty offer. So your job offer has to say, that you're a nurse practitioner or you're a nurse uh, 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 surgeon, sur surgical. Yeah, it has to it has to be specific. Specialty, to, okay. It has to be a specific specialty, mm -hmm. and a lot of the staffing agencies just have regular nursing positions, and so you have to find uh, a hospital, an employer with a specialty need who can extend you that offer, mm -hmm. and then the hospital, you know, would employ their lawyer or they would employ us to be able to file that petition on your behalf. All right, so on blessing is asking, please. My friend is already in the US with a B1B2 visa and has gotten I140 approved. Her visa is expiring soon. Can she continue staying in the US until retrogression is over, or what can she do? Well, if she has an approved I140, chances are that her priority date is current because you know, I mean the retrogression went into effect on May 1st. And I I, I doubt anybody who applied, you know, uh, after May 1st is an approved I-140. And so if she if she has an approved I-140 now, the chances are that her priority date is earlier than what the visa bulletin says. And if it is, then she would be eligible to apply for uh, adjustment of status immediately, not, not a visa extension. So have a look at the I-140, uh, uh, see what the priority date is, go on the visa bulletin and then see whether she's eligible to apply for adjustment of status. And if she is, then her best option would be to apply for that adjustment of status. Okay, awesome. So um, I just want to make a comment. Uh, BSN is not a specialty. So what we are saying is you have to have a degree and a specialty in nursing. So the hospital that is going to be employing you will be looking out for that specialty that you have. So it's like you're coming in here to solve a problem. So um, you are you are going to work in that very specialty unit. Then, then that's when we can start talking about the HB1 visa. So someone is asking, I do have an MSc in mental health. Can I assess the H1B visa options? Yeah, the, the answer is yes. Uh, that's that's a good, that's a very good question. Um, the answer is yes, because one, you have an advanced degree, which is the bachelor's, and you have training or experience in the mental health. And so what you need to do is find a job offer that is specifically for mental health nurses. And you know, my job as a lawyer would be to prove to the government that the offer that you're receiving from the, from the hospital is a specialty occupation. So the burden of proof is on us 
we have to prove to the government that your job offer is different from a registered nurse and that you're a specialty occupation. And a mental health nurse definitely qualifies. Now, you do have to have the experience to show for it, and then you do have to have the certification to show for it, because all of those things will be instrumental in submitting proof to the government that you have a specialty occupation. Okay, all right. And I do have another question. It says, how can we switch from EB3 visas to H1B from Nigeria? So I don't know if this person has already, you know, been in the process of getting an EB3 already. So it didn't, it didn't say, but I guess that's the question. Well, I mean, your if if your employer has already applied for for uh, uh, an EB3 visa, it's just a matter of uh, changing the classification so they can submit uh, an amendment to to the application they filed, switching it uh, from from one one visa to the other one. So if you look at the uh, the the form I140, okay, on page one of the form I140, on the bottom right side uh, towards the the yeah the bottom right side, there's a couple of boxes there. And those boxes are for which visa that you're applying for. There's uh, uh, professionals, skilled workers, and, and, and a bunch of other classifications that are there. The box that we check for EB3 is skilled worker. So if you want to switch over from skilled worker to a professional, a professional is somebody with an advanced degree who can apply for the H-1B, uh, you'd have to submit an amendment. And, and you know your, your agency who, who apply for the EB3 visa would be able to help you with that. All right, uh, let me see. Now, I guess I can put a caveat on is that it's not just a matter of switching it. They have to change your job offer, you know, because uh, the AB3 visa, they probably just gave you a registered nurse position. They have to have a specialty position. So not everybody, if you have a BSN or an advanced degree, it doesn't automatically qualify you for the H-1B visa. You have to have a specialty offer from the hospital to be able to take advantage of it. All right, so next question is, you know how it is in Nigeria. I already have a BSN alongside the HND in pediatrics. So I guess this is confidence that we answered before. So if you have a BSN, you have a, a HND already, you've passed your NCLEX, just do send us um, an email with your resume to distancestaffingsolutions.com and we can arrange an interview with Mr. Douglas, okay? All right, will the retrogression likely end anytime soon? Ebere Uku is asking. Yeah, um, you know, th th there's a huge need for nurses in America. And so I, I don't foresee uh, this EB3 visa or, or nursing visas in general going away. I mean, we've had a very, very long history of retrogression. This is not the first time it, it, it's happened. Um, and there's always a solution to it you know, because the, the, the need is so dire and huge in the U.S. Now, as I said in, in the beginning, the beginning of the fiscal year is October 1st. So, uh, you know, from October 1st, uh, there's going to be 140,000 new visas available, of which 28.6% would be allocated to EB3 visas. Now, you have to remember the, the 140,000 is not the only visa that becomes available. All of the visas from the previous year in the in the family-based petition that has not been used, they now are added to the employment-based visa to increase the 140,000 num number. So for example, this, this fiscal year, uh, fiscal year 2022, uh, we had about 197,000 visas available. So that's about 56 to 57,000 uh, visas that were captured from unused family-based petitions uh, that were added to the employment-based ones. So there's a good chance that in in, uh, uh, in in the fiscal year 2023, which begins on October 1st, 2022, we're going to have, you know, perhaps the same number, which is uh, 50 to 56,000 visas added to the 140,000, which would inc increase the number of employment-based visas available. So the hope is that at the beginning of the fiscal year, we don't have too much demand uh, for for the EB3 visas more than the available visas. And if that happens, retrogression will go away. Now, when retrogression goes away, the visa bulletin says current, right? And when the visa bulletin says current, you know, um, a lot of people are going to apply. And that's when premium processing would, would come into effect. You know, everybody's going to be applying and, 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 and paying for premium processing because they want to get ahead and they want to get it done earlier. And so 
there's a good chance that it will be short lived. I mean, the 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 demand for 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 EB three visa and the nurses are are, are uh, exponential. You know, they're higher than in, in, in previous years, and that that number USCIS expects that number to uh, to keep you know to keep increasing. And so, to answer your question, uh, I guess I don't really know for sure whether retrogression is going to go away in October. Nobody knows for sure. We're hoping it does because that's when the new visas come out in October. And if it does, you know, then then people will be able to apply for it. Uh, but if it doesn't, then, then we're still in the same limbo that, that, that we're in. All right, Mr. Douglas, there's some questions I'm thinking some of us might, you know, have it in our mind, but I just want to ask. Um, the 143,000 visas that are available, is this for the primary applicant? Is it counted as one visa? Or if someone has a family of about 10 people, one person is the primary applicant, is this counted as 10 visas? No, I mean, the... the, the, the uh... It, it's it's on on the the principal applicants, okay. and so that that counting is this yeah on, on the principal applicants and not necessarily the, the the derivatives. All right, so that that means that at least you know let's look at it as a hundred and forty something thousand families will be you know yeah having that option of using the EB three visas in the next fiscal year. Right? Yeah, I mean like like I said in the beginning, the hundred forty thousand, all of them don't go to EB three. There's five different categories. Right, I got you. And and even even with the five different categories, there's there's different country specific conditions. So there's India, there's China, there's the rest of the world, the right? World, yes, yes. So so that fifty six percent is even divided even smaller in allocation to specific countries. Right. Okay. I hope we are learning something, guys. I hope you guys are understanding the immigration. You know the words. He's trying to be as use the lay term as possible, you know, try to get that very answer to you, you know, your question. So just, you know, if you haven't asked your question, if you have any question, just put your question on the comment section, we'll get to it, okay? All right, so a next question is from Uchenna. He's saying, please, when already there is an, a job offer, how long does EB3 take? Well, like I said, the 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 first step in an EB three visa is the the I one forty petition, which takes on average six to eight months to get approved. And then once your I one forty gets approved, you will get a notification to the national from the National Visa Center uh, that is inviting you to 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 apply for the DS process. Now, uh, the DS process, you know, it's a consular processing. You go online, you complete your DS form, you do your medicals, you you attend the interview, and then if that you're successful in the interview, you would get the visa to travel to the to the U.S. Uh, on an EB3 visa to begin working in, in, in the U.S. Uh, for people from West Africa, the problem is compounded because in addition to the visa retrogression, it's extremely difficult to get an interview date uh, because it's my understanding that people are buying these, these visa dates and selling them and, and all kinds of other things that are going on there. And so it's it's difficult to estimate a time uh, for people in, in, in Ghana, Nigeria, and I think Ghana and Nigeria specifically, where, the, where that problem is very dire, um, for you to get a date to go to the embassy. You know, they're, they're, the dates are in, in, in way, way in the future, and if and if, you, if you can get them, you know. And so to answer your question, under normal circumstances, you can look at a year and a half to two years. With retrogression, it's it's difficult to tell. Uh, because it, it's all dependent on whether or not you know the the, the, the retrogression goes away and, and we come back to to where EB3 visa is current. Sorry, thank you so much. And my next question is from Matthew Kum, Kumwande. He said, is retrogression happening for the first time? If not, how long did it take to, to be rescinded the last time, I guess? No, it's not. It's not happening for the first time. Um, I mean, you know, th there was a time where we used to do a two one two visa where the nurses weren't given green cards; they were just allowed to come to the U.S. and work. And then when when their 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 contract ended, they were they, they had to go back to their their own country. You know, and then in in the in the early two thousands, we also had uh, retrogression. Um, typically, uh, I, I would say it's taking you know. I mean, it, it sometimes it you know it, it goes back to 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 a month. Sometimes it takes a year. I mean, it's difficult to tell how long it's it's going to take because it's, it's based on the number of visas that they get, and it's not even real numbers. This is just a USCIS estimation. 
Now, they make a reasonable estimation as to whether or not they're going to exceed the number of visas available and then set the priority dates, you know, uh, appropriately to that. And so it's difficult to tell what their estimation is going to be, how many visas they are receiving on, on a real basis to make that determination. Right. Okay. And Maggie, I hope that answered your question. You have a do, Dora Good, NOS, Dora Good. Okay. So it says NCLEX is the first step before H1B and other types of visa, right? Yes. I'll answer that question so he doesn't have to waste time. <laughs> the answer is yes. You got to go get your NCLEX. Okay. You can self sponsor yourself for the NCLEX because most agencies now are not sponsoring because it doesn't really make sense for them to start throwing in money. But for you as an individual, it makes sense for you to get your NCLEX. That way you are a step ahead of orders that when the agency decide, oh, now the visa is current, um, the visa bulletin is current, we have to start going in to get people, they have to start preparing them for NCLEX and waiting for their CES report and all those bottlenecks in NCLEX. But by then you must have gotten your NCLEX and be like, I need my NCLEX um, bonus. You just get your bonus, all the expenses and you made for the NCLEX, you just get it from the agency and then you will be, in, be the first in line at that, at that point. So uh, yes, the answer to your question is yes, it is the first step. All right. So another question is, can you throw more light on priority dates? Um, yeah, I will leave that to Mr. Douglas. Yeah, um, I'm going to share my screen here and then I can uh, show you. Okay, so this is the July, the July visa bulletin. Uh, you scroll down to, and you can get this visa bulletin by just going on Google and then Google visa bulletin. And then uh, um, it should be the, the first thing that pops up should be the date, you know, the, the month, and then click on the, the most recent month and you should be able to get this. So this is the employment-based categories. There's two different tables. There's the A and there's the B. Now, the B is the date for filing for employment-based visa applications. This is the, this date is your eligibility to file, okay? So if you have an, an I-140 with a priority date earlier than May 1st, 2023, you're eligible to apply for either an adjustment of status or to apply for a DES form to go to the embassy. This, this, this date just means you can apply, you're eligible to apply, okay? Now, when you scroll up here, the final action date is your eligibility to receive um, a green card or to receive uh, a decision on your consular processing. And it's February, 2022. So this date just basically means that this is the earliest. If you have a priority date earlier than this, you'd be eligible to receive a decision on your adjustment of status or on your consular processing. So those are the two the two separate uh, dates. And then these visa bulletin comes out on a monthly basis. And so it, it changes from month to month. Now, if you look at these other categories that have the C, the C is what we want. The C means that there's no waiting period. It's the, 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 the visa in, in that category is a current, right? And EB3 used to be current, um, but but now it's not. And so we want we want these to change to become Cs. That's when you know that the visa, the, the, the you know, the, the, the visas are current and that you can apply and you're eligible to receive a determination on your application. Awesome. Thank you so much for that insight. Okay, so um, next question is from Ijoma. Ijoma, Rachel um, is asking, from what you have said about filing for I-140, it is also best for your employer to hold on or file for regular while waiting waiting for the outcome of the retrogression. So um, it's asking, can employers, you know, use the, instead of going for premium processing, go the route of um, you know, regular processing just because yeah, it doesn't really make sense to do premium at this point. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, your employers are going to tell you that. Your employers are going to tell you that they're not paying for premium processing because it's it, it doesn't do you any good. It, it doesn't benefit you. It doesn't benefit them. Um, USCIS just makes more money. $2,500 is a lot of money uh, for them. You know, and, and these employers are, are, are sponsoring thousands of people. So you can imagine the number of money that they're spending on, on premium processing. Now, whether or not it makes sense to apply now or wait, uh, 
until retrogression goes away. I would say it makes sense to apply now for your I-140 because you get a priority date, which means that you're in line, right? Uh, you want to be in line. Even if the line is long, you still want to get in in line. Now, if you want to wait until retrogression goes away, you know, you're just delaying your, your time in the line, in the queue. You want to get in, in, in line as soon as possible. And so my suggestion would be if you're eligible, you've passed the NCLEX, you have a job offer uh, and all of that. My suggestion to you would be to apply for the I-140 as soon as possible so you can get a priority date because that is your spot in line. Awesome. Thank you so much. Get in the line. I can't stress that enough for you guys. Get in the line. Whatever you are doing, this in the, it works is the game of numbers and it works like everybody has to be attended to according to how they come. We call it in nursing first, first in, first out. So if you're first to get in the line, you're going to be the first to get out of the line. So please, please, please make sure you take something away from this meeting today. Get in the line. The next question is, can an ICU nurse apply for H1B visa? It's not just being an ICU nurse. He said it over and over. I don't want him to go over these questions. Like, you know, if you know your question has been asked, you know, it's okay if you can ask me for the recording, I can give it to you. You can, you know, listen to it after this meeting, but we can like keep on asking the same question. ICU nurse is a specialty. If you have done your intensive care nursing before getting into that, that's a special, but you also need a degree for you to qualify for these H-1B visas. Okay, can an F-2 who has passed NCLEX be eligible for H-1B visa? Yeah, if, if, the, if the, 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 the F-2 uh, F two student has an advanced degree and a specialty uh, occupation, yes, they, 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 they're eligible to apply, they apply for it. And, you know, like I said from, from the beginning, if you're on F1 visa or a derivative, which is an F2, um, and your, uh, you know, your 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 visa is about to expire, you need to find a way to remain in the in, in this country. Now, for F1 students, if you have uh, uh, you did nursing and you're an F1, you, you know, you apply for OPT. You know, uh, OPT would give you work authorization and 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 give you. Uh, uh, the the option of remaining in the U.S. And, and also working. So you're gathering experience while you're working and, and you, you apply for your I-140 and then you're in line waiting for your priority to become current. But there's there's a couple of things that uh, that, that you can do uh, to, to, to keep you your, your status active. If you're an F1 student, you don't, know, you don't qualify for OPT or you can't find an, a job to sponsor you for OPT, we have a lot of agencies that would that would sponsor you uh, for OPT, and I don't think finding a job is, is a problem really uh, for, for OPT. Now you have to figure out what visa to get to make you eligible to stay. Uh, you can, uh, you know, go back to school for an advanced nursing degree. I mean, there, there's there's a few things that you can do, but you have to make sure that you don't fall out of status. I mean, that's the key point here, is that you have to make sure you stay eligible for an employer to sponsor you. You have to remain in status. You have to be legal and make sure that your visa doesn't expire. All right. Thank you so much. And if you are that person that you're asking this question for, I would just encourage you to send an email to distancestaffingsolutions at gmail.com. And then we would find you an appointment, you know, have you talk with uh, Mr. Douglas one-on-one, -on -one, explore your options. And we can possibly like start this process for you. We can start the the um, uh, uh, H-1B visa options for you in this, uh, like after the interview or after the appointment with Dr. Do uh, Mr. Douglas. I don't know why I call you doc doctor. That's, that has happened like two times now. Are you a doctor? <laughs> I, I'm not, you know, I'm not. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, lawyers have uh, Jewish doctorates, but they don't. Right. we don't use the title of doctors. No, I'm not. Right, okay. All right, so, um, okay, the next question is, please, I joined, um, please, I just joined. What is H-1B visa? I'm trying to, I'm trying as much as possible. Well, you're going to have the, uh, you're going to have the recording. So you exactly. can send them the recording afterwards. Exactly. So we're going to do that. All right. So thank you. And her, somebody is asking the blessing. We answered that question before, but this is a follow-up question. She said her priority date is December, 2022, which makes her fall in the retrogression. So like he said, is the, um, the visa blessing is current up until February 2022. So uh, this person is still in the retrogressed uh, population of nurses seeking um, entry, entry into the US. Okay, I have my BSN and the specialty in public health. Will I be at an advantage? 
Yeah, the, the answer is yes. Uh, advantage as to whether or not you go the H-1B route. The EB-3 route, there's no advantage there. Um, but the H-1B route, if you can find a specialty occupation in public health, as a public health nurse or or something like that, uh, you know, and, and, and your employer can prove that that is a specialty occupation, then yeah, you may be eligible for the H-1B. All right, next question. Next question, let me see. Let me get there. Said, um, can the whole family relocate with the H-1B visa? Yeah, I mean, H-1B visa is is, is a non-immigrant visa. Um, so yes, you know, uh, your, your family, you know, your, your, your dependents can come with you. Um, children under the age of 21 and your spouse, those immediate family members. And so, and so the, the short answer is yes. Okay. All right, and the next question from Star is, my friend has gone for interview, but her application is still on administ administrative processing. Uh, since her interview in February, however, her priority date is July. And is it possible they can give her visa with this retrogression? Well, uh, priority date, if the priority date is before, uh, on or before February 1st, 22, you know, she's eligible for, for, for adjudication. So, you know, is the priority date earlier than that? If it is, then, then yeah, you know, um, it's not how long the interview goes for. It's whether or not you, your priority date is, is current or is earlier than, than the dates on the visa bulletin. All right. So, sorry, I'm going to take a little, little time from you and just make an announcement because uh, the administrative processing just reminded me of a very, um, disturbing, very concerning uh, issue that a lot of people have been having with, with the consular, you know, processing the EB3. And I just want to make that announcement here. If you are applying for EB3 visas and you want to use that opportunity to bring your whole family here, just I'm just sounding this as a warning. It's not your your brothers are not eligible, your sisters are not eligible do not falsify documents. Do not try to make them your, maybe you have a younger brother, you're trying to say that the younger brother is your son. It has actually made a lot of people to be placed on administrative processing. A lot of people recently have been asked to do DNA tests just to know if the people they are coming to the US are their children. So it's been very, very growing concern because so many people are being smart, but I don't consider that being smart. It's actually being stupid because they are actually being placed on administrative processing. Most of them have been denied their visas, EB3 visas can be denied because of all these growing concerns. So please just get you and your immediate family here in the US before you start fighting for your whole community. All right, just, just a little insight there. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when, uh, uh, when, when you, you get on a plane, they tell you in the case of emergency, you put on your own oxygen max first before you help the other person, right? Exactly. If, uh, if you don't help yourself, you can't help your family. And mm -hmm. the mistake that we do is that when an opportunity opens up, we want to help everybody else instead of focusing on ourselves first. The best thing you can do is focusing on yourself and your immediate relatives first. And then once you're in a better position, you can reach out and help other people. But trying to, to, to help them while you haven't helped yourself would jeopardize your own opportunity. And so it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for you to go through those, 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 those routes. Okay. I see a question. Someone said, I was denied immigrant visa in June 2023. Um, no reason was explained to me. I had all the required documents. I was asked to tell my agency to request for a waiver. My agency hired a lawyer who sent an email to the embassy in Lagos, but no response from the embassy. Can anything be done? Yeah, I mean, you know, we get these questions all the time. If, if they ask you to apply for a waiver, that's a reason, right? When you said no reason was given to you, when they ask you to apply for a waiver, it means that they found some sort of inadmissibility. I and mean, the biggest thing for these immigrant visas, when you go to the embassy, is that they're looking to see whether you're admissible. I mean, that the law requires them to. And if somebody's asking you to apply for a visa, they are asking uh, apply for a waiver. You know what they're in, in essence saying is that you're inadmissible, and that you have to apply for the waiver of that inadmissibility. So the question is, what waiver are they asking you to apply for? You know, uh, and and once you determine what waiver they're asking you to apply for, you can figure out the reason 
for that. And typically, you know, the, the document that they give you telling you to apply for the waiver has a reason on there, you know, and, and if they're asking you to apply for a waiver and your, your attorney is sending them an email, nobody's going to respond to that email. I mean, the, the embassies in, 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 in Africa specifically are very notorious for not responding. You know, they don't have to. Uh, there, there's no law requiring them to, to, to do that. And so your agency or their attorney would have to apply for whatever waiver they're asking you to apply for. All right. So can you throw more light on what could make an individual not to be admissible um, in that category? Well, yeah. So inadmissibility, uh, th there's various things that can make a person inadmissible to the U.S. Um, I think the most common one is misrepresentation or fraud. Um, in, in immigrant visas, they're not looking at whether or not you have an intention of returning back to your home country. So on a B1, B2 visa, whether the primary objective that they're looking for is, have you demonstrated that you have enough ties to your home country such right. that you would return back home? So when you go for a visitor's visa, that's what they're looking for. When you come to an immigrant visa, I mean, you're coming here to stay, so you don't have to show them that you plan on going back home. But you have to demonstrate that you are admissible. So if you have a criminal history, if you uh, if if there's misrepresentation, uh, if there's fraud, if there your, your documents don't add up or you don't qualify for the benefits that you're seeking, all of those things can make a person in, inadmissible. Um, so you'd have to look at it. one of the things that we ask people when we first you know uh, send them to to the embassy is have you ever been to the embassy before. And if your answer is yes, then we do an inadmissibility test with you. Uh, we look at the previous documents that you've submitted to make sure that the new one that we're submitting doesn't have anything that contradicts what you sent originally. A very, very notorious thing that makes people inadmissible for visas from Africa is age, ironically. Um, people sent birth certificates to the embassy that has a different date previously, and then they, 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 they do this employment-based visas and they have a different birthday or a different birth certificate. And then they submit an affidavit that says, my mother says I was born on this date and it was a mistake. So, you know, the person adjudicating these things is a human being, you know, and and, and they look at it and, and you know, already they're, they're looking at, they're looking for instance of fraud uh, because they receive a lot of fraudulent applications and you just give them a reason to label yours as one, you know. And so those are some of the things that you have to be very careful about is consistency. If you've been to the embassy and you submitted a set of documents with a set of specific facts, your subsequent applications has to mirror that. I mean, you know, you have to you have to make sure that your birthday is the same, your your relatives. I mean, the, the U.S. embassy keeps meticulous records. You know, you'd be amazed. I mean, people feel like uh, when you apply for a visa, they don't have your uh, your information in their system. If they take your biometrics, it's matched to everything that you have. And so they would ask you on your DS application, have you ever applied and been denied for an, Im for an immigrant or a non-immigrant visa? If you have and you say no, that's misrepresentation. That makes you inadmissible. If you say yes, then you have to give the reason why you were denied. And then that gives them the, the, the it tips them off to go reference your application against the ones that you've previously submitted, right? And so some of these things, you know, it's silly, small mistakes like that 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 cost people uh, these 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 things. But my suggestion uh, to you would be when you're going for the to the for the DS phase, if you've ever applied for any kind of visa, cross reference your application, the, the information on your DS form with the previous applications you've submitted to make sure that everything matches. And if it doesn't match, then then you might be in for a surprise. Okay. Wow. That's an, uh, a lot of information right there. All right, so someone is asking, can the whole family relocate with H, uh, say HB3? I guess you're trying to say H1B visas. Yeah, H1B, I mean, I think they're talking about derivatives, which is, but yes, the answer is yes. Uh, for the H1B, yes. Uh, while on EB3 visa and waiting for retrogression to elapse, can one source for visas from another countries like Canada and that's what people are doing now, uh, Mr. Douglas. So yeah. a lot of people immediately they heard there is progression. Everybody went a while to Canada, Nova Scotia, um, Abata. So many provinces in Canada are requiring nurses. So a lot of people are there doing that process, 
and uh, you know some others are in, in Europe looking for you know how to get into Euro Europe. So is this something that we we need to stay put and wait out the process, or you know do you think they should start shunting to other country? Well, I mean, for as far as immigration um, is concerned, you know, there's nothing that requires you to remain in your home country pending the outcome of your of your application. I mean, life must go on. You must live your life and you must have a backup plan. Um, the What you need to look out for is when you go to these other countries, they're going to require you to sign a contract. And the contract typically has X amount of years on it. So for example, if you went to Canada and you became a nurse in Canada, you have a three-year contract and retrogression goes away this fall. Well, now you're locked into a three-year contract that you cannot leave. And so you may forego the opportunity uh, in the U.S. And so that's that's the only thing you have to think about. But in terms of immigration, it doesn't really affect you to go to a different country. Awesome. I mean, you know, you might have to you might have to go back to your home country to do the DS processing, or you can have them switch it over to whichever new country that you're in to do the DS processing from there. So you're good to go, Arjun. So if you want to go to Canada, um, that's OK. But uh, well, I, another thing I think about this is, you know, you just don't have to be in the U.S. I know you mentioned other country, but once you are, you know, you fight for I-140, there's a, a caveat there that says you can't be in the U.S. while that process is going on. Because once they run a check and they find out that you're in the U.S., your application might be um, denied. Am I am I correct, Mr. Douglas? Yeah, I think I think you're you're. Uh... Uh, so, so there's there's a few things that the I-140 itself does not give you any kind of immigration benefit. So people who are here on a B-1, B-2 visa, uh, people who are here on an F-1 visa can still apply for an I-140, okay, while 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 they're in the in the U.S. But if you apply for an I-140 while you're in the U.S., there's a box on the I-140 that asks whether or not you're going to do pursue an adjustment of status or you're going to pursue consular processing, and you have to answer that question. Now, if you're going to pursue an adjustment of status in the U.S. Uh, and you apply for an I-140 wall in the U.S., you have to make sure that your visa is current. If you're going to uh, uh, be pursuing consular processing, then you have to, to to make sure that you leave the country before we apply for your, your I-140. I think that's that's what you're, 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 yeah, you're getting at. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. If you are doing the consular processing route, you have to make sure you're not in the U.S. For some of you that have... Uh, B1, B2 visas, you know, you just make sure you're not in the U.S. while you're pursuing the other one, especially if you're not, if you're using the consular processing. All right, can the whole family, yes, we said, we answered that before. Can one already with an agency file, at, uh, already with an agency file and at DS-260 level apply for visa to countries like Canada, we said yes to that. Uh, did we say we said yes to that because uh, we we can actually switch your consular processing, um, you know, locations from Nigeria or whichever country you're in to another country. Thank you for thank you so much for the response. Thank you so much for explaining priority dates. Um, just reading more comments. My hour forty was filed on May thirty first. This is Juliet and was approved on July eighth. Am I eligible for interview dates? Um, July, um, Juliet is asking. Yeah, Juliet, it depends on your priority date. So look on your I-140 approval. It would have a priority date on there. If your priority date is before May 1st, 2023, uh, you are eligible to apply. Now, if you filed on May 31st, uh, as, as you said, um, then there's a good chance that your priority date would be, you know, uh, sometime in June, and so then you would you would not be eligible to apply yet. And so, Juliet, it all depends on your your uh, your priority date. And go on the visa bulletin, look at the, the the dates on the visa bulletin to see whether or not you're eligible to apply. All right. Um, we're gonna you know at some point we might stop taking questions just so we stay in talk. Like I don't know, I know he's very busy today, and we are just like one hour plus in our meeting. So, but we we'll keep on taking questions. Um, you let me know when the questions are becoming too much, okay? I think we have uh, we have about thirty more minutes, and then we have to uh, to call okay. it good, maybe. All do, right, do thank it you. On a different day, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for saying that. I was about to ask you if you can come on another day and just throw more light on 
what and what we think you know these um, agencies hospitals are looking for when they interview our nurses because a lot of nurses come to me and say that you know they were interviewed and they didn't um, meet up with the requirement of the hospital so can we you know we are going to plan another time to just look at that because i know you're very good at that and you've been in that uh, very for a very long time yeah i mean the the, the weird thing is you know i i uh, um one of the the biggest so when, when an agency is interviewing you, they're, they're looking for three basic things. The first one is your social cues. You know, uh, the second one is, is professionalism. And the third one, which most people feel like the agency should be looking for, is your ability to work as a nurse. Now, if you pass the NCLEX, they assume that you're, you're, you're qualified to be a nurse because, it, you know, there's a lot of processes to go through to be able to pass the NCLEX. So everybody who passes the NCLEX is on the surface eligible to be a nurse. Now they're looking at social cues. Now I myself have done a few interviews where um, people people will get on these Zoom calls and they're they're in their pajamas, you know. Or, or sometimes people get on the Zoom calls and they're in the market. Or it's very noisy in the background. The, the, the connection is not clear. I mean, all kinds of all kinds of uh, things that you wouldn't do if you if you're going for a job a job uh, interview. I mean. Even though this is over Zoom, it's still it's still a job interview, you know, and you have to you have to be professional, and and a lot of people get turned down because of the you know the lack of professionalism. I mean, people people do these Zoom calls like they're doing a FaceTime call, you know, with their friends, and 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 that's not the case, you know. This is a job interview with a potential employer, and you have to you have to be professional when you show up, and and you have to show decorum. And, uh, and 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 show them that you're going to be a good employee uh, to bring value to their company. You have to understand, you know, these agencies they receive hundreds of applications, and so you know, the, and their reputation is on the line when they put you in the hospital, right? And so they're they're only picking people that they know are going to be good nurses. It's not the fact that you've passed the NCLEX doesn't guarantee that you're going to become a nurse. You know, you still have to go through the process, be a good employee, uh, do well in the interview and all of those things before you can be, before they can hire you uh, as a nurse. And sometimes I feel like the professionalism is lacking. And, and that's the primary reason why specifically I turned down a lot of people as a professionalism. All right. Thank you so much for throwing light, in, um, more light to that question. Is it possible for another pathway to be made separately for nurses? Um, alone since us is in high demand for nurses to prevent uh i i don't think uh, mr douglas is a congress a congressman yet so <laughs> I, I think you can make that move that move but yeah. you, you can... so there's uh yeah there's an association of uh uh, uh uh staffing agencies american association of uh uh foreign nursing recruiters i think is what it's called and they have uh, uh, uh a bill that they're lobbying for and, and the purpose of that bill is to allow nurses to come to the U.S. and wait for their visas to be approved, which would benefit, you know, the U.S., that people would come here and start working while they're waiting. Now, that bill hasn't been passed yet. Um, it hasn't even been introduced in Congress yet. And so, uh, yes, it's in the work. People of people above my pay grade are working on it. And uh, hopefully it passes. And, and when it does, it would be a good thing for all of us. Okay. One is asking what is premium processing. So he's asking. Premium processing is just basically um, uh, a method by which USCIS front lines your application. So you pay them two thousand five hundred dollars, or the agency pays them two thousand five hundred dollars, and they give you a decision within three weeks of you of them receiving your application. Now it doesn't mean they're going to approve it. It means they give you a decision, whether it's a request for evidence, whether it's a denial and approval they would give you a decision within three weeks of receiving your application. That's what premium processing is. All right, so one more question from Cherry. Cherry is asking, so in that case, one with specialized master's degree needs to reapply as an APRM before benefiting from the H-1B visa because at the moment we have job offers as RN. Secondly, is it possible to register as an APRM from outside the United States? And then I mean, uh, in order to apply for HB, H-1B visas, does one need to get another job offer as an advanced practice nurse? 
the answer to all three questions is yes. Uh, so the, the first one is that, yes, you need a new, a new job offer. Um, you know, the, the, the job offer has to say, you know, you're a specialty nurse, not just a registered nurse. Uh, the, second, the second answer, whether or not you can register from outside the U.S., yes, just like the enclaves. I mean, the, there's no... The process, the path that you're on in taking the NCLEX, the exact same thing. The only difference between the EB3 and the H1B is that you have to have a specialty occupation. So yes, you can still register uh, as, as as an advanced, you know, registered nurse uh, outside outside the country if your program is accredited and and you can you can you know go through the credential evaluation process. Um, and then the, the third step is yes, your agency has to give you a different job offer. Um, you know, reflecting that specialty occupation for for you to go to go that route. All right. Um, one more question. Sorry, um, somebody is asking: Can someone with BSN and specialty in AE that have passed enclaves but have no job experience yet get um, a job? Yeah. So the specialty occupation, you know, has a. Uh, uh, a very a very specific definition. Now you can go to the USCIS website and look up the definition of specialty occupation. It's a combination of your qualifications and experience, and so it depends on what the the employer's uh, specific job uh, qualifications are. If the employer is saying that I need you know somebody with two years experience, then then yeah, you wouldn't qualify, you know. And and so it depends on what what your your employer specific uh, uh, job uh, requirements are. Okay, Trevor is also asking, please explain the different visas to me. Uh, that is the difference between one and uh, two ETC, that's EB1, EB2, and the rest of them. Please. Yeah, I mean, that, sorry, you're getting all kinds of questions. I know. Yeah, I know. so the, the employment based petitions there's first priority, second priority, third priority, EB1, EB2, EB3, EB4, uh, and five. Um, you know, the, the EB1. Typically, they call it the genius visa. I mean, somebody who who has uh, uh, an advanced research or high, you know, somebody who is advanced in the sciences or you know, the cure to cancer. I mean, it's an advanced it's a genius visa is, 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 the, is the is the other name for it. And the EB two, uh, somebody with an advanced degree, you know, like uh, uh, doctors, lawyers, and, and things of that nature. And then there's the EB three, which has two different categories or well, three different categories: uh, professionals, skilled workers, and and uh, um, uh, um, all others, which is the catch-all phrase for everybody else. And, and uh, so it's just different priorities and different kinds of degrees of qualifications to apply for, for each one. But each, each one of those visas require a specific level of qualification to apply for. Okay. All right. So starting again with another question, I said for visas that was re refused without waiver, is it possible that a litigator can get a positive out outcome if hired? Well, if I mean, first of all, it depends on how long your visa was 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 rejected. Um, there's no appeal process for consular processing uh, because it's based on their discretion. Now, if your visa was refused and you you feel like it was refused to it was refused due to a reason that that uh, uh, that doesn't make sense or a reason oh it's 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 it, it's uh, uh, it was rejected wrongly or refused wrongly, you can get a hold of your, your agency and, and typically they can do something about it. They can reach out to, to the embassy and figure out the exact reason why it was rejected and then and then figure it out. I've seen visas that were refused previously where the agency gets involved and then they, they put it back in administrative processing to get additional information uh, from the agencies. And so it depends on your specific case, why it was rejected or refused and whether or not your agency is willing to do something about it. Uh, you have to understand, you know, the, the agencies are running a business. Uh, I know that this process is very intimate and it's very personal to you. But for the agency, um, you know, for, for, for better or for worse, you're one of a thousand, you know. And so when your visa gets refused, the agency has to make a business decision. Do they spend money on you to try to get your visa overturned? Or do they take that money and go get a new candidate? Now. Which one is cheaper for them? If they go pay an attorney to go fight this and get you a new one versus go find somebody who can easily get it, which one makes business sense for them? And so sometimes the agency will make a business decision and say, well, 
it's better for us to spend, you know, five thousand, six thousand dollars to get a new candidate than to spend ten thousand dollars fighting this one. And and that's that's not personal. That's just the business decision they make. And and you have to realize that, you know, as hard as that may sound, you know, uh, at the end of the day, it's a business that they're running, and they have to make these business decisions. Thank you so much. And you know what? Um, assuming that agency spends that ten thousand dollars fighting the case and doing all that, you know you know, fancy stuff. And then the candidate comes in here, knowing what the agency went through, sees another job that was better paying and then goes AWOL, breach the contract. Right. So you see, and that has been, in fact, I'm gonna come on the Zoom again. And so we can talk about breach of contract, all implications. I was an agency nurse. I did my three, three years, I guess, yes. Even though it wasn't up to three years because my agency did with ours. But I did mine, I stayed put, integrity, that's all that matters. You don't have to, because uh, people are doing it, you have to break your lease, break your contract, bridge up. All those things has consequences, okay? So we're gonna come and you know try to educate people on kind of decisions they make when they get in here, what the consequences might be. We're gonna be here, or that's gonna be another topic. But one, uh, another question we have here is, um, if I got you right, you said that the regular processing takes about eight months. Um, if the employer applies for I-140 and retrogression ends before I-140 is approved, can your, um, can your employer reapply for priority date? You can reapply for priority date. Priority date is actually the date that you file for your I-140. The first day that you file for your I-140 is the day that is considered your priority date. Uh -huh. I don't know if you have something else to ask, uh, add. Mr. Oh, I, I think I think you answered you answered that. Your priority date is based on the day that USCIS receives your application, on the day you filed it. Um, so if if you filed it and they receive it and they put that priority date on your receipt, that's your priority. Date. You cannot change the priority dates. Okay, so someone is thank you so much. Somebody else is asking: Does relocating to Canada or UK while waiting for visa guarantee your speedy consideration when the retrogression saga is over? Like you know, I know sometimes you you send people to Jordan. They do a program and then there because the wait time there is kind of I think that's where this question is going to. Yeah, so I, I have a, a couple of clients that are staffing agencies and and, and um, one of them, one of them is, is Westways Staffing Services. Now, uh, Westways has devised a program where when they apply for your I-140 while you're waiting for your I-140 to be approved, they send you over to Jordan, the country. Uh, for you to do skills lab or training, training on, on, on nursing in America. And the reason they chose Jordan or the Middle East is because a lot of the hospitals in the Middle East were actually created by American doctors and American uh, medical system. And so the charts and, and all of those things are very, very similar to, to the American medical system, the charting and the, the processes and, and, and all of that. And so they send you over to Jordan, you do your training for about six months in, in, in Jordan, and then you apply for your visa from Jordan. The benefit of applying for your visa from Jordan has nothing to do with retrogression. It has to do with the issue of people not getting dates in Nigeria or Ghana. And, and you know, in Jordan, you get, you, you know, if you, uh, if you were to apply, if your priority date was current and you're doing a consular processing, you can get a date next week in Jordan. I mean, it, you know, not a lot of people are applying for visas from there. And so you get an earlier date. And typically, uh, it also shows the, the, the consular officer that this is a legitimate thing. I mean, you've been in the country training for six months to come do the work that you're originally going to do in the U.S. And so you have a, a, a higher uh, chance of, of, of approval, not a guaranteed chance of approval, but typically a higher chance of approval than you, you would be if you were applying for your from your your home country in Nigeria or, or Ghana. And so the only benefit of going to Jordan is that you get a, you get a better date and earlier dates if your priority date is current, but it doesn't solve the issue of the retrogression. Yeah. All right, then next time I say hello, I miss you. So, okay, I'm not gonna read that, sorry. So how does I, this retrogression uh, affect the nurse? Sorry, go ahead. So, yeah, the question that, that was asked earlier about uh, priority dates, uh, the person clarified and said uh, they meant pre uh, premium filing, not priority. So yes, you can you can request premium filing at a later date. So if I file as a standard application, there's an option for me to then, as a follow-up, request for that application to be processed through, via premium processing. 
So yes, that's an option. Your employer can change your filing after they filed it from a regular filing to a premium processing. All right. Okay, thank you so much. Someone is asking, how does regression affect nurses? Because they stay in their home country, they don't have to come until the retrogression is over. <laughs> okay, so over to you, Mr. Douglas. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the retrogression just means that you have to wait a little bit longer, uh, typically over, over a year. I mean, right now it's retrogressed till May 2023. Uh, we're in June, so 13 months backlog. That's that's what retrogression means. All right. Um and this backlog can change any day, any month. Like, I'm getting to next month now, something else comes out, I say, okay, it's drawing closer, you know, so it can change. So it's not something like it's static. Uh, e. John Marichal says, I was made to do certificate evaluation with Morningside, not minding my CS report from CGFNS from my attorney. Reason was that my I-140 might be turned down with just CES report from CGFNS by USCIS. No error was found in my report. Is it a new trend? Not, not really. I mean, um, sometimes, you know, uh, when you do the CGFNS report, you know, um, I've seen this with nurses from Cameroon is that sometimes when they get the HND um, and they apply to states like Florida, uh, Florida requires, I think, 400, is it, is it, I think it's 400 hours of lab. Yeah. Right, right. I've seen that. And so sometimes these nursing schools only have like 300 hours or 350 hours or something. I mean, they're a little bit short on the hours for their labs. And so the attorney would tell you to go do some course, some certification to get you up to those 400 hours so that you can get your CES report. And so when you, when you, it depends on the state that you're applying to and whether or not you meet the requirements for getting a license in that state. If you if you fall short a little bit, the attorney might ask you to go do a, a top-up course or, or, or some sort of a course that brings you up to speed so you can get your CES report. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Douglas. Good news is that we finished all the questions. But we have two hands that are raised. I guess these people want their voice to be heard. Okay, so MNK Onyechi and Ola Dimeji, um, if I ask you to unmute, you can ask your questions. If you have any question, I see that your hands are raised. So you can unmute. I've asked you to unmute. And then Ola Dimeji, you can also unmute if you have any questions. All right. Do you have any question, guys? Is top up nursing from UK accepted in the US? Uh, someone else is asking a question. Is top up nursing from UK accepted in the US? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what top up nursing means. Okay. If you mean as, as an advanced degree, is that it? No, no, no. Top up nursing is like, you know, uh, moving from diploma nursing to uh, BSN nursing. This program is actually done in the UK. So it's like a very a short uh, program where they, they just do supplemental courses so you can be awarded the BSN degree. So they assess what you have done and what, you know, maybe those people hold like a higher national diploma HND. So they go to UK, they have some courses, they do it within nine months, I guess, nine months to one year and you come out with, um, with your BSN. So I think to answer that question, they have similar thing here in the US. So you can do from, you know, diploma to, a BSN program is a very short program. So I guess it should be, a, you shouldn't have any problem being accepted in the US once you have completed the program. And once you're not doing like a program transfer or something like that, you should be good with that process. Okay. Ola Dimeji, do you have any question? All right. And um, Suzanne Ibokwe, do you have any question? I've asked you to unmute. Yes, yes, I have. Um, good evening to the both of you and everyone on the call. Thank you so much for your time and for really, really answering our questions um, and not getting bored of us. Uh, my question actually is um, regarding um, previous immigration history. I'm so happy you touched um, a topic that has been bothering me for a while. I have a history of denial um, though it was immigrants, my dad was filing for me, but however, I was denied. And um, 2019, 
I was I filed for um, a non-immigrant and it was I was also denied. So my question is, does it have any implication? Does it affect my application for the EB1, for the EB3 visa this time around? It, well, the answer is yes and no. And, and uh, um, being denied in the past does not forbid you from applying in the future. So to that extent, no, being denied in the in the past does not preclude you for, from applying. So yes, you can apply again. Uh, the second part of the question as to whether or not how it would, it would affect you. Um, if your application was denied uh, due to inadmissibility reasons and you have to apply for a waiver and you don't apply for that waiver, then yes, all subsequent applications will be denied because you didn't apply for that waiver. That inadmissibility still stands. A waiver is basically a pardon. You're asking for forgiveness for that specific and inadmissibility reason. And I don't know the reasons why you were previously denied. Uh, and and I don't necessarily think this is the forum to, to talk about, you know, very intimate reasons as to why you were denied. But, and, and so we can, you know, uh, if you reach out to decency, we can talk about this in more detail about your specific situation. But to answer your question, if your, your visa was previously, whether it's immigrant or non-immigrant, was denied in the past due to inadmissibility reasons, and you have not applied for the waiver to overcome those reasons, you will be denied every single time you go because that that inadmissibility reason is still there and, and you haven't dealt with it. All right. Thank you so much. I don't know if Oladimeji has a question because I've asked you to unmute and um, um, I didn't do that. I hope that answered your question. So. Hello? Hello, hello, I'm here, I'm here. Okay, Oladimeji, go ahead. Ask yes, your question. thank you very much. I really appreciate the topic you put each today. I'm so happy about it. I'll be hearing about this regression and I didn't understand it. But right now, I think I understand everything. But my own question is that now, I'm a registered nurse midwife by diploma, not BLA, BSA. But for the HB1, I think I'm right. Uh, they said is not applicable to the, it doesn't mean it does not applicable to the register no bid right diploma. That's what I want to know. Secondly, concerning my, if I want to find my process now, for my own uh, wedding certificate, the date that was on my wedding certificate, it is not my date, which I later wondered the second day of my wedding, which I told them that this is not my real date. The date was... I think they made a mistake on it. They have to give me a letter that cover it up. Those are ones timed, or I should go and do another one. That was I want to know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So the the uh, the nurse midwife one. That's that's a good question. Um, we have seen people nurse midwives uh, get approved for H one B as a specialty occupation, because it is a specialty occupation. Um, so the answer is yes, nurse midwives can get H-1Bs approved as a specialty occupation. However, you need an advanced degree and a diploma is not an advanced degree. And so while you may have the specialty occupation, you don't have the advanced degree, uh, which is one of the requirements of the specialty occupation. So if you can get a BSN, a minimum BSN um, or BSC, you would then be eligible as a nurse midwife to apply for the H-1B. And you have to have a job offer that is a nurse midwife specific job offer, okay? So I hope that, that answers the, the first question. Uh, the second question is the issue of dates. And to be frank with you, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what the reason is, but it's it's a problem that is very very rife in, in in Africa. Is that for some reason we always seem to get dates confused or dates mixed up on our documents, and those problems don't happen in America, you know. Uh, and if it happens, it's not very common, as common as it is in Africa. And so the the consular officer who is an American um, looks at your your marriage certificate and then says well, how come you have a wrong date on your marriage certificate? And the more you try to, I don't know, you know, it was one of those things where the more you try to over-explain, the more guilty you look. <laughs> <laughs> and so you start, 
yeah, you, you start explaining yourself and you get nervous. And then this guy is sitting there or, or this lady is sitting there looking at you and they think you're lying about something. And then they deny your application due to misrepresentation or because they don't, they don't believe you. And so if, if you have, you know, uh, uh, discrepancies in your dates on, on your visa applications, my suggestion would be to make sure that you have the, the most correct, most up-to-date uh, version, and it's consistent with the previous one. Now, if you've already submitted a visa application with a different date, I'm not saying don't file again. You can file again, but you need to keep in mind that that is going to become a problem. It's a question that you have to answer at the interview. And there's a good chance, there's a 50-50 chance that your application will be denied because of it. Because they have this preconceived notion that people lie about their age, they decrease their age, or they decrease, you know, they, they marry somebody just to bring them along with them. That there's all these preconceived notions already before you get there. And you don't want to give them any reason to apply any of those preconceived notions to you. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Douglas. And uh, this is going to be our last question. Um, Star, you're going to ask your uh, question, and we'll take that as our last question. And then I'll ask Mr. Douglas to give us one or two few words before he leaves us. And we'll, we'll make a pact with him today that he's going to come back uh, and uh, dissect another topic for us. Okay? All right. So, Star, ask your question. I've asked you to unmute. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, I wanted to ask about this uh, inadmissibility without a waiver. Is it possible that one can still apply again? And what is the chances of the application? Yeah, so if, if they're asking you to, um, if they deny your application and they didn't ask you to file a waiver, they didn't, they didn't tell you a reason. I mean, typically they tell you a reason for the denial um, of your application. Uh, you're entitled to a reason for the denial of the application, and typically they'll give you a one-page paper that has some reason on there. If the reason for denial doesn't require a waiver, then you don't need a waiver. You can reapply. But my, my question then to you would be, if you're reapplying and you don't know the reason why you were denied prior, previously, how then do you make sure that the new application doesn't have the same problem, right? Um, so for you to reapply, it would be smart of you to figure out why you were denied in the first place and then make sure that you resolve or fix that issue uh, when you when you apply again. Otherwise, you're just, you know, Thank you're you just much. wasting your time and, and, and money, right? That's true. All right. The answer to your question, Chama Ede, is yes, you can. You can, you know, because there are some things that uh, Chama is asking, can I be fired with one state license and deploy or work in another state when I arrive? Some of these things changes. You know, your hospital can say, you know what, you're no longer, when you have gotten your visa already, you know, it doesn't, once you're, once you're fired, any other thing that happens can be regular life events that, you know, can change, you know, the consular office also understand that some things can change, but there are some things that are not expected to change, like your date of birth. <laughs> your date of birth is not supposed to change. <laughs> so that's what we're saying today. So those are the, you know, things that are not, you know, regular dynamic life events, but those ones that are dynamic, like work, location, where you live, all those kind of things, they can change. Your address can change, okay? So it's not tied to, your visa is not tied to, you know, you must be in this address until you're given the visa or, you know, just like what the question you ask. And uh, thank God, can someone without NCLEX, but in the process with BSN and registered nurse midwife with 10 years experience apply for it? When if you're in the process, you're not yet there yet. So you have to wait out the process, be in the, um, in whatever, school you are, finish the program, you know, get some little experience and do your do your NCLEX. And then you can now start talking about which visa option you can benefit from. All right. Someone is saying thank you very much, Mr. Douglas. I really appreciate your time with us. I'm elated to hear all these and it's an amazing session with you today. Thank you so much. So um while you're saying thank you on the comment section, keep your ears open because um, Mr. Douglas is, is uh, repositioning himself. I know he wants to get up. So he's gonna give us a little like, you know, final words, you know, just like closing remarks. And then um, just uh, keep on uh, saying thank you. He's gonna read all that. I guess he's reading it when he's coming. So tell us how much you like this program and we can bring him back again on the program, all right? 
So guys, I mean, I I, uh, I, I think that the, the long and short of it, what we've covered today, we've covered what, what retrogression is, um, what it means for you as a nurse, um, what, what, what it means for you in terms of arriving in, in the U.S., We've also talked about some of the common reasons why people get, get denied uh, for their immigrant visas. Uh, we talked about some other things that you can do in the meantime while you're waiting for your visa prior date to become current uh, to make yourself more marketable and also to, to make yourself eligible for a different visa category. Uh, in short, you know, retrogression just means backlog. And right now we're, we're backlogged severely. Um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't apply for your I-140. If you've passed the NCLEX, my suggestion still would be to find uh, an employer who would petition you for the I-140 so that you can get in line. Getting in line is the most important thing. And then once you get in line, at some point, it's going to get to your turn, and then you can apply for, uh, for your consular processing to be able to come to the U.S. If you're already in the U.S. on a B-1, B-2, F-1 visa or any kind of other visa, Please find a way to stay current. Do not overstay your visa because that would affect your employment-based petition down the road. Uh, the third thing we talked about is your documentation with the U.S. Embassy. Triple check all of your information uh, to make sure that everything that you're submitting is, uh, is in fact correct and up to date. Uh, don't, don't try to outsmart the system. It's going to come back and bite you later down the road and it's going to create uh, more problems for you and, and potentially uh, prevent you from ever immigrating to the, to the US uh, in the future. And so those things we've, we've, we've talked about, the retrogression, we're hoping it goes away in the fall. I don't know for sure, nobody really knows for sure, uh, but all of us are looking at the visa bulletin on a monthly basis to see where it goes and, and, and whether or not uh, uh, it, it moves forward and becomes current. And, and once it becomes current, you want to place yourself in a position now, before it becomes current, so that when it becomes current, you can apply for your uh, immigration benefits immediately. And so that's why it's important to get in line with the with the I-140 filing um, uh, uh, right now. So that's 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 what we, we've talked about. Um, you know, uh, I, I enjoy these these conversations because it it for me at least it makes my job easier down the road. So that all uh, you know. Uh, I see there are some people in 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 their in their on this call that I have uh, personally filed their immigration petitions for. Uh, it's it's nice to to, to see all of you guys uh, here, and I know you've been sending me a bunch of WhatsApp messages that I haven't had a chance to 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 uh, to, to answer. And so I'm hoping that this this forum answers some of those questions and it offers the opportunity to prevent other questions down the road. And so I'm happy to 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 organize one of these things later down the road when we get. Um, uh, a good number of people who can who can attend, so we can answer some of these questions at once. But uh, you know, all, all in all, we're on the right path. Um, everybody on on the Zoom call either uh, has dreams of, of 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 coming to the U.S. to work as a nurse, or is or is already in the process of working to become a nurse. The process is still very much alive. Retrogression is not. Um, it doesn't it doesn't preclude you, or it doesn't cut off your ability to immigrate to the United States. All of this is a, it's a speed bump. It's a delay. Yeah, it slows down the process a little bit, but the process is still very much alive. And there's a lot of very, very uh, uh, smart people who are working towards making sure that there's other avenues to bring nurses here because, quite frankly, uh, America needs it. The hospital needs it. And, and I don't see it going away anytime soon. So um, I, I don't think this is, this is ever going to go away. It's just a matter of when you'll be able to come. So if you have any other questions, you know, you can reach out to Decency and then we can see about arranging another meeting. But it was very nice talking to you and uh, um, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to answer some of your questions. Right. Thank you so much, Mr. Douglas. You've done a great job today, just as usual, explaining things in the best way and format that uh, every layman can understand. So thank you for doing justice to all the questions that we, you know, we asked you today. And our, our uh, expectation is that when next we find you um, your free time, we ask you to come here that you grant us another audience. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you. And for everybody that has been on this meeting today, I just want to say a big thank you to you all. You are you all are awesome. You know, I know you have lots of things you're doing, but you know, you just um, 